today's scripture. Psalm 103, verses uh, 1 to 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities sounded, suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. That's verses 17 to 20 of Psalm 107. Psalm verses 21, the Psalms verses, verses 21 and 22. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to the sons of men. And let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy. Now Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10. And you he made alive when you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the courses of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among those we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind, and so we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, who is rich in mercy, of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him, and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. Next slide, please. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God beforehand, which that we should walk in them. Thank you, Robert. Now for the sermon, we have André Merino, who's going to be talking about our light, our truth, and our life. I apologize for the, the delays in the slide switching. I seem to be having problems with my connection here. Go ahead, André. Thanks, um, John. Uh, appreciate your work. Um, I don't mind if there's a delay, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going. So I'll, uh, I trust that you're gonna be able to catch up if there's any delay. So hello everyone, <clears throat> except um, uh, for, forget me, my voice is a bit uh, <clears throat> rough this morning because um, I'm a bit under, under uh, the, uh, the rain this morning and hopefully it's not gonna last long. So um, as you just learned the theme, the theme, is God's provision uh, 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 of salvation. And the title is Our Light, Our Truth, and Our Life. And it's based on John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Perhaps the most quoted scripture in the entire Bible is John chapter 3, verses 16. Remember, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. For many believers, it is the first scripture committed to memory. This scripture reference is so popular that it can be seen and plastered on billboards, painted on signs, held up, held up at various sporting events, uh, etched in even in jewelry, and even tattooed on person's skins. While John 3, verses 16, 
does provide us with a nice little sound bite for the gospel, it needs to be placed in proper context, which paints a much sharper picture of the overall message that John is trying to convey about Jesus. As today is the fourth Sunday of Eastern Easter preparation, it is only fitting that we look at a passage that alludes to the reality of Easter. While John 3 verses 16 fits nicely and neatly into Easter reality, the rest of our passage today will be a test for us. A test to find out if we are prepared to consider three things we all must face. And these three are the cure, the enigma, and a crisis. And I'll explain them in, in, in the message. But before, let's start reading John 3, verses 14 through 21. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And he who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. In verse 19, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. And last verse, verse 21, but he who does what is true comes to the light that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. There's a lot of stuff in, in, in these few verses and um, we'll explain them further along the sermon. So at the beginning of chapter three, we have a conversation that takes place between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is, uh, as, as you probably know, a Pharisee. Not only that, but he is described as a religious elite. He is a member of the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. You could say that Nicodemus was a celebrity among the Jewish people. At this point, Jesus was already drawing attention um, of the religious re leaders, and he was not being looked on favorably. And so Nicodemus approaches him at night, where he would not be seen by his fellow Pharisees. Earlier in this chapter, John shows that Despite Nicodemus' great spiritual learning and the fact that he is Israelite's teacher, he fails. He fails to understand something that Jesus presents to him as fundamental to one's spiritual life. Nicodemus is not tracking with Jesus on his need to be born from above to be made new. What Nicodemus is hearing presents him with a costly challenge to lay aside his understanding of how the world works, to acknowledge that the things that were to his credit and gain may in fact be seen as a loss and a detriment to his spiritual well-being. 
Jesus then describes to, to, decides to share with Nicodemus an event from the scripture he knew he would recognize. And that leads us to point number one, the cure. So Jesus said to Nicodemus, and we read this earlier, he said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. To whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Here, the story that Jesus refers to is found in Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. Let's read it. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea, that is the Israelites, to go around the land of Edom. And, to, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we loathe this worthless food. In verse 6, then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray for the Lord, pray to the Lord, that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. In verse 8, And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who, who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit a man, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Notice here, the request from the Israelites was to take away the serpents. And this is not what God did. And we'll uh, continue in our message and you'll understand why. The Israelites had grumbled against God in the wilderness. As a result, deadly snakes came and bit many of the people and many died. God then told Moses to fashion a bronze serpent on a pole. Moses then was then to lift it up and even and anyone who looked upon it would live. That is the cure. That is the cure. Jesus takes the story and draws the connection between it and what will eventually happen to him. And in the way, when Jesus lifted up on the cross, he's lifted up in the cross, whoever looked upon him will live as well. Jesus will be the ultimate eternal cure for humanity. God did not remove sin. God did not remove the serpents, but he provided a cure. The idea of uh, lifting up has more than one meaning. There is the obvious meaning of Jesus being lifted up on the cross, of course, but there's also the idea of Jesus being exalted, where Jesus has ascended and has come into his glory. In a previous verse, verse 13, Jesus is alluding to his ascension by saying in John 3, verse uh, 13, <coughs> no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven. The Son of Man. So this double meaning makes a lot of sense in the context. You know, being lifted up and being exalted. When Jesus says that all who believes in him will have eternal life, he isn't asking for an ascent 
to a set of facts. Jesus is speaking about a definitive trust to place all of our weight upon Christ as our Savior. This trust, then, is not founded on our religious upbringing, our abilities, our degrees, positions, or even possessions. This may be the way that the world worked with Nicodemus, and it may be the way the world works for us, but this is not the way of the cross. Our trust, our trust is in the fact that our cure is totally and completely found in Christ and in his finished work on our behalf. Jesus, as it was for, uh, just as it was for an economist, so for us, there will be much that we either don't understand or have a hard time giving into. Let's, let's give you an example here for, for, for a moment here. Many music, teachers as well as language teachers may tell you that in general, it is harder to teach adults these skills than it is to teach children. There may be several reasons for this, but we'll focus on one particular reason here. Children already in learning mode. They are in school and as such, they know that there are, there's so much they don't know. When they make a mistake, they just brush it off and keep going. With adults, mm, it could be a different story. Most adults finish their schooling long, long ago. At this point in their life, they have accomplished certain things in their life, and now they want to feel competent. When learning a new skill, your ego takes a hit, right? As the mistakes seem to keep piling up. The challenge is to be like a child, like a sponge, really to learn, humble, and to realize that you are starting something brand new and acknowledge that you are no longer the competent one. Maybe this is key here. This is key to understanding Jesus. When he said in Matthew 18, verses 3, he says, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So, really, Christ is telling us, Behave like children. Be ready to learn. And be humble. The idea is to embrace being made new in Christ. We have been given a gift to trust that God is everything, uh, that, that Jesus is everything to us that he is. He said he said, he said he is. I will get it. <laughs> we get the privilege of being able to trust that he, he is daily making all things new by his spirit. We all have been bitten by the fatal things of sin that were filled with death. But there is life everlasting as we look to Jesus as our one and only cure. And we trust in him. So Jesus continues in his conversation with uh, Nicodemus, and this will lead us to our second point, the enigma. So in verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Verse 18, 
He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. John here continues this section here with the most famous verse in the Bible. It is the verse that tells us that Jesus is what? Jesus is God's gift to us. This is God loving us with the fullest expression of himself to prove us how much we are loved by the Father. It's sometimes behind our, behind, beyond our comprehension. It's so great. So verse 17 and 18 provide us with enigma here. If Jesus was not sent to judge but to save, then why do people refuse to believe? Simple question, huh? When a person chooses not to see God for who he is, he judges himself. If someone refuses the love of God found in Christ, they are condemning themselves. It's like a person who holds unforgiveness in their hearts towards another person. He judges others. He creates a sickness that eats away at, at our own souls. It's really, if you hold a grudge to, against somebody else, it's going to hit you, get hit your heart over time. It's going to have an impact on your health and mental health as well. So we read in, for, in verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. This verse states God's purpose in sending the son. It is not to condemn, but to save it. We dare not take this gift of God's son lightly. It was an enormously costly gift for God to give, and we ignore the gift at our peril. We should not imagine, however, that Jesus came into the world to shut the door on unbelievers. He came to hold open the door to the kingdom of God so those who would enter in God's turn would be saved. It is human decision, not divine decree, that condemns those who refuse to accept God's terms. Jesus' saving work reveals a dark side of earthly life. If it is necessary to God to send a son, to send a son to save the world, it must be that the word needs saving is lost. Furthermore, the son's work is efficacious only if the word accepts the preferred salvation. John puts it this way, as we read, as we read in verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only, of the one and only Son of God. Jesus' name is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Joshua. Joshua means God saves. The New Testament gives Jesus many titles, as you know, Christ, Messiah, Lord, Master, Emmanuel, etc. But Jesus is God saves, is his name. The one who fails to believe in the name of the Savior has not accepted the salvation offered by the Savior, and thus has been judged already. The mission of Jesus was not to judge, but to save us. And part of that salvation plan includes freeing us from the way that 
we damage and judge ourselves and others. If we don't do this, we damage ourselves and others, brethren. So it's important to believe in Christ. So that leads us to the last point here, the crisis. In verse 19, we, re we read, and this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. In the last verse, verse 21, but he who does what is true comes to the light that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. The word for judgment in verse 19 here that we just read comes from the Greek word crisis. Crisis with a K. It is the same pronunciation as the English word crisis with a C. Jesus is saying that there remain, remains a crisis. Although the love of God has come to us in the form of Jesus, offering us everlasting life, we are faced with a crisis. The judgment, the judgment or the crisis is that many prefer not to embrace the light, which is Christ, because they are accustomed to concealing the darkness of their hearts. To those who would follow Christ, illumination is necessary. And this is what scares many people. To embrace love, we must be vulnerable to the truth. That proposition can be frightful and even painful to think about. He came because us, uh, we can become so attached to our to our ego, to being right, to being superior, or on the flip side, holding up our wounds and victimhood like trophies. In either case, we created false identities, and yet, if we step into the light. It risks exposing all we have held into. It exposes the lies and delusions that we have believed for so long and have given us meaning as distorted as those meanings may be. Verse 20 and 21 set up a contrast between two types of people. In verse 20, Jesus talks about the one who practices evil. And in verse 21, he talks about the one who practices truth, truth in Christ. Without Christ, our goodness can actually be the problem because our righteousness, as mentioned in Isaiah 64, verse 6, is as filthy rags. Let's read it. We've, we, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. We are called, brethren, simply to come into the light, the truth. We are called to respond to God's non-judgment, for us, we are called simply to come into the light, the truth. We are called to respond to God's non judgment to, uh, of us. This is what it means to be converted. We no longer fear the light. Instead, we acknowledge all that we are, all that we have done, all that we have known and place it all before the crucified and risen Christ. And we let his truth, his light, shine upon our entire being. 
We have all been called to leave behind those things we desperately want to keep hidden in the dark. Instead, we are to embrace the truth of who Christ is in all that he has included, included us in. We are to talk and walk in the light that has been graciously given to us. We stand as one whose judgment under Christ is not guilty. Brethren, each and every one of you are not guilty. We have been freely pardoned and are freely loved. We stand now as ones who will live on, not just in this age, but in the age to come. Marvelous. We stand as ones who embrace all that the love of God has for us. We stand as ones who look upon the exalted Christ as known and known him as our light, our truth, and our life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, André. That was uh, enlightening. And it's something that uh, 